Here are my winners and losers of the 2019 NBA offseason. This includes the draft and free agency. And notice how I said my opinion. I can say a team won and I can say a team lost, but at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. These are just my opinions, but you can let me know yours down below in the comment section below. And we can disagree and have an argument. It's just a great basketball topic to talk about because teams will win, teams will lose. That is how it works every single season. I really want to begin by saying this. There are some teams that I have losing and some teams that I just have average, but it wasn't their year to do something special. So some years you will have a good off season and some years you won't. But that is okay because every year there are moves and trades and things that happen which can dictate what your team does. So if I say that your team wins or loses or just does average, don't get offended because sometimes it isn't your year. For example, the Dallas Mavericks. They already made their move at the trade deadline. They got Kristaps Porzingis, which meant that they didn't need to do anything this offseason. Now, did I have them winning or losing? Well, I had them losing, but that is just the offseason, which includes the draft and free agency. But they had already won at the halfway point of this season. They go into next year with a much better team. So, you have to understand that some teams have already made their moves, but it just doesn't count in the offseason. Now, if you enjoy these videos, I would very much appreciate it if you guys could drop a like to support the channel and subscribe if you're new for daily NBA content. Here are my winners and losers of the 2019 NBA offseason. And the way that we're doing this is going from F to E to D to C to B and then A minus A, A plus. So at grade F, the Phoenix Suns. I think we can all agree that they didn't have a good offseason. It all started during the draft, where they ended up trading the 6th overall pick which could have been used to draft a guy like Kobe White, instead they traded that off, ended up getting Cam Johnson way later in the draft, and the only thing they got for the 6th overall pick was Cam Johnson and then Dario Saric who was entering free agency next summer. Then, they only really got Ricky Rubio, they lost out on TJ Warren, Josh Jackson, Holmes, Troy Daniels, and they basically only gained Rubio and then Cameron Johnson and Dario Saris during the draft. And then they also got Aaron Baines and Frank Kaminsky, but we can all agree that they lost in this year's offseason. The next team I have at F is the Charlotte Hornets. Obviously, we can agree, paying Terry Rozier the contract that they paid him, and obviously not willing to trade Kemba Walker away from the team, which they could have got something in return, is a major loss for the Charlotte Hornets. The thing is, I actually really like Terry Rozier, but you could have got something way better than Terry Rozier in a trade for Kemba Walker, and they didn't do that. And then they also lost their second best scorer in Jeremy Lamb and Frank Kaminsky. Yeah, they didn't have a very good offseason. Now, the next tier is a little bit harsh, but these are teams that were just competing for championships and they really couldn't do anything this offseason. Now, the first team on the letter E is the Toronto Raptors. I think we can all agree that losing out on Kawhi Leonard was obviously a big loss. The Raptors obviously not only lost Kawhi Leonard, but Danny Green as well, which is just a huge loss for them. But at the end of the day, it's not their fault they lost out on Kawhi Leonard, but it's just not a good thing for them, and that's why they didn't do very well in this offseason. Like I said, it's not their fault, but I think you can all agree, if you're a Raptors fan, it's just unlucky, and you just took an L. The next team is the San Antonio Spurs. Originally, this team would have been like a C team, just an average team. They're a team, like I said, that is competing in the Western Conference, but because they didn't actually land the guy that they wanted to land in Marcus Morris, really they only ended up getting Damari Carroll, Keldon Johnson, and a few other pieces, and they lost out on Davis Bertans. Now, if you actually watch the Spurs, Davis Bertans was actually a very good player for them. He's a guy that stretched the floor and was actually a key piece to what they did. They obviously re-signed Rudy Gay, but at the end of the day, they are not going to be able to compete against the Lakers, Clippers, Jazz, and all the other teams in the Western Conference, and they didn't even end up getting Marcus Morris, which means I just don't think that they did very well. But in saying that, it's the Spurs, and they don't need to always do well during the draft and the offseason. The next tier is D. I have the Dallas Mavericks, and I just feel like they already made their move getting Kristaps Porzingis, re-signing him obviously to a bigger deal this offseason was very good for them, but at the end of the day, they didn't really do anything else. They lost out on Al Horford, which they wanted, but at the end of the day, they still have cap space to get somebody in the future, which means in the future, they should be set, but as of this offseason, it was just okay. And they ended up getting Porzingis at the halfway mark of last season, so they already made their move. The Bucks are the next team that are at D. 
This is a team that obviously lost out on Malcolm Brogdon, which was a key piece to what they were doing. They obviously re-signed Chris Middleton to a max contract, which to me, I don't think he's a max player, but I understand why they did it. They keep Giannis happy. They go into the Eastern Conference with basically the same team. I do rate the signing of Matthews, and I do like Brooke Lopez re-signing and obviously Middleton re-signing as a team. But as a whole, in the future, if Giannis is entering the 2021 free agency, and this isn't a team that can go to the next step with an aging Brook Lopez and Chris Middleton on a max contract, this will be interesting to see how the Bucks go. And to me, because they were a contending team, they didn't have to do anything special, which is why they didn't do anything special. But to lose out on Malcolm Brogdon, I just think that they deserve a D. Okay, now we're going to the C level, where all these teams just did average. They didn't do amazing, but they did average. And these are basically all the lottery teams that ended up getting decent draft picks. The first team I have at C is the Washington Wizards. The main piece that they got from the NBA free agency was obviously Isaiah Thomas. He, if he is healthy, can be an MVP candidate, and he's shown that. But the thing is, we definitely have no clue what he'll be, which is why at this point, it's just hard to rank them. But simply because of their draft pick in Rui Hachimura, I believe that they had a good offseason because I really do like Rui Hachimura. And I believe that he'll be a good piece for the Washington Wizards the Chicago Bulls. I really like their draft pick in Kobe White. I think he'll be a great point guard for them and they needed a point guard. And I just think Thaddeus Young is a great veteran to have alongside their young core. And obviously to add Sadoransky, who is a decent point guard, is not too bad either. Even if he's just a backup to Kobe White or even if he starts, I feel like the Chicago Bulls did well with what they had. I have the New York Knicks. I believe it's not as bad as everybody makes it out to be. This is a team that to me was obviously trying to attract the best free agents possible. Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Kawhi Leonard, all these guys. And when they lost out on them, they said to themselves, you know what, we're not going to get the top guys. Let's wait till the 2021 offseason, which is just insanely stacked. Giannis, LeBron, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, all these guys are going to enter the 2021 free agency and the Knicks will try and get them then. They just signed a whole bunch of role players to two-year deals, which means they'll be off the books when the big free agents are available. And they did sign Julius Randle, which to me is a great player to sign, and a young player that you can build around your young core of RJ Barrett, which means their offseason automatically goes up, considering that the offseason includes the NBA draft, and RJ Barrett was the second overall pick. So you add that with Julius Randle, and you still have guys like Kevin Knox and Dennis Smith Jr., and I believe that that is still a great offseason, just by simply adding a guy like RJ Barrett and Julius Randle to a team that is just rebuilding. The Minnesota Timberwolves, like I said, they're at the C bracket. They just did average. I like their draft pick of Jarrett Culver, but apart from that, they just had an average offseason. They signed a guy like Jake Lehman and a few other pieces like Noah Vonley, but they just didn't really do a whole lot. And they also lost out on Derrick Rose, who was actually a decent player. So I'll just say that they did an average job simply due to their draft pick of Jarrett Culver. And if they hadn't got him, they probably would have been even further down. But Jared Carver brings them up to a C. The Pistons, they're also at a C. They were just average this offseason. They still have the potential to do something. But as of now, they got their point guard in Derrick Rose, who had a pretty good season last year. And I do like their draft pick of Sekou Dumboya, who has the potential to be a decent player in the league. Obviously, we don't know what he will be, but I like their pick, so I'm going to give them a C. Same with the Orlando Magic. They re-signed Vucevic, they re-signed Terrence Ross, but they didn't do anything spectacular. But they still have the assets to make a trade. But as of now, they just did average in this year's NBA offseason. I like Vucevic but they're still just not a good enough team to do well in the East, even if they wanted to. And that's why they just had an average offseason. Because really all they got was Alpha Rukaminu, and I guess that's just average to me. And obviously we don't really know what their pick will end up being, but behind guys like Mo Bamba and all their other young assets, I feel like he'll just be another trade piece. The next team was the Cleveland Cavaliers. They obviously didn't do anything this offseason in terms of free agency, but I do like who they drafted. Darius Garland was the best player available, and they also traded for the 30th overall pick and selected Kevin Porter Jr., who I really, really like. And they also got the 26th overall pick in Dylan Wildness, so I just think that the Cleveland Cavaliers during the draft made their team even better, and obviously during the offseason, in free agency they didn't have the cap space to do anything but their draft picks just push them up to a C because I do like what they did I believe that the Houston Rockets automatically jump up to an average team. They obviously made the trade to get Russell Westbrook to pair up with James Harden. If you want to watch that video, I made a whole video on it. You can check that down below. So I'm not going to get too into it this video, but 
I believe that considering they hadn't really done anything else but replace Chris Paul with Russell Westbrook, I just have to give them a C rating, but I think it gives them a good chance to now compete in a tough Western Conference. And the last team at C is the Sacramento Kings. They lost out on Willie Colley-Stein who requested out of there, but they ended up getting some decent players. They obviously re-signed Harrison Barnes to a pretty big deal, which I'm not really sure why they paid him so much, but I guess they do like him. They ended up getting Dwayne Dedman. They get some veteran guys like Corey Joseph, Trevor Ariza, and Holmes. And obviously, they didn't have a first-round pick this draft, so I just think they just had an average offseason with what they could have done. And they got some veteran guys on a young team to help them develop, so I don't think they did bad at all. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Here we go to the Bs. I have the Oklahoma City Thunder as of now as a rank B, but obviously the Thunder is definitely subject to change with what they do with Steven Adams, Dennis Schroeder. The Oklahoma City Thunder, they managed to transform PG and Russell Westbrook into Shea Gilgis Alexander, Danilo Gallinari, and about eight first round picks, which is just insane. Obviously they lost Paul George, which automatically brings them down to an E. But what they got in return was a ton of assets, the most draft picks ever, which brings them up to a B in my opinion. And because it wasn't just the Clippers draft picks that they got, it was the Heats and a few other teams, it makes their draft picks even better. And obviously they now have the potential to rebuild, and they build with some very young assets of Shea Gilgis Alexander and a whole ton of picks. The next team is the Denver Nuggets. This is the team that didn't need to do anything this offseason. They're a young team in the Western Conference that really can challenge any team, but they managed to add Bol Bol, who's a guy that has potential to be anything in this league, and with the draft pick that they selected him at in a trade with Miami, it's basically a risk versus reward, and if it's a risk that doesn't pay off, well, it doesn't even matter because they have their team set anyway, but if it's a risk that actually pays off, it is insane. Not to mention, they picked up Jeremy Grant from the Oklahoma City Thunder, which I actually really like for this team. A guy that is very athletic, a guy that can stretch the floor a little bit if he's wide open, can hit the shot. And they lost Trey Lyle, so to get Jeremy Grant is a very good replacement. And they just did well with what they had. The next team is the Boston Celtics. Now, I don't love the acquisition of Kemba Walker, but I do believe he fits well in Brad Stevens' offense, and he's a very good replacement for Kyrie. But the fact that they lost Kyrie, Al Horford, and Marcus Morris is a Pretty tough offseason for them, in my opinion. Gaining Kemba Walker, but losing out on three players that were key parts to their team. I just don't love it. But they ended up getting Kemba Walker, which I guess you can't complain if you're a Celtics fan. And then Ennis Cantor is a guy that is decent, but he's nothing special. So... I just think they ranked a B. I could have ranked them lower, but I think that Kemba Walker will elevate his game in Brad Stevenson's offense. He'll be kind of like what Isaiah Thomas was for the Boston Celtics. And if Tatum and Brown can improve to that next level, Gordon Haywood can come back a little bit better, then the Celtics will still be a decent team in the Eastern Conference and can still challenge. And the last team on the category of B is the Memphis Grizzlies. This is a team that very surprisingly made moves this offseason. Obviously, they already go all the way up with their acquisition of Ja Morant, a guy that was the third overall pick in this year's NBA draft, but what they did in free agency was also very good. This is a team that ended up getting Dwight Howard, Andre Iguodala, freed up some cat space in Chandler Parsons, have the ability to get some more assets in trading away Dwight Howard and Andre Iguodala, and they ended up making some moves where they traded Kyle Korver away for young assets assets like Josh Jackson. I just believe that as a whole, it was a very good offseason for the Memphis Grizzlies considering they weren't expected to do anything, but in a rebuilding stage, getting Ja Morant and adding some veteran guys that they can release and get assets from, it's just a very good position to what they were in before this offseason. Now, here is the A-minus teams. The first team is the Golden State Warriors. When we expected the Golden State Warriors to have a terrible offseason after obviously losing Kevin Durant and DeMarcus Cousins, they ended up bouncing back with D'Angelo Russell, a guy that can replace Clay Thompson while he's injured, and obviously Willie Colley Stein. That is something that no one expected heading into this offseason. Now, obviously, they won't keep D'Angelo Russell, in my opinion, when Clay Thompson gets back, but it allows them to have a trade asset. And obviously, they lost Andre Iguodala and Sean Livingston, but these are guys that were aging and just veterans guys and to get D'Angelo Russell a young guy on that team alongside Willie Collistein is just incredible for the Golden State Warriors and I think they did very well. The Miami Heat obviously getting Jimmy Butler, getting Tyler Hero in this year's NBA draft and obviously freeing up some cap space which they didn't really have before the offseason is a great move for the Heat. 
Now, I'm going to go through the rest very, very quickly, but these are my major winners. At A, the Portland Trailblazers. I think getting Hassan Whiteside to replace Nurkic was a great move. And once Nurkic gets back, Whiteside can be used as a trade asset, along with a first round pick to even get a guy like Kevin Love, in my opinion. The Pacers did quite well. Obviously, they lost Bogdanovich, but to get a guy like Malcolm Brogdon and Jeremy Lamb, I believe that they did well. Even if they did lose Bogdanovich, I still think they did very, very well getting those two guys on their team. The Hawks were major winners. Not really what they did in this year's free agency, but what they did during the draft. Obviously, to pair up their young piece alongside Trey Young and John Collins, they ended up getting Bruno Fernando, which I really, really like. And obviously, getting DeAndre Hunter and Cam Reddish, two top 10 picks, is extremely good for them. And they're major winners in this year's offseason. And then the 76ers, obviously to replace JJ Redick with a guy like Josh Richardson, way younger and can still hit the three, is extremely good for them. Plus the addition of Al Horford on that team, amazing defensively. No one's going to stop them in the Eastern Conference with Joel Embiid and Al Horford. Insane moves by the 76ers. And then the A-plus teams. Obviously the Pelicans. It literally could have been Zion Williamson alone and they would have gotten an A-plus. But not only that, Lonzo Ball, Brandon Ingram. You know the rest. Jackson Hayes, incredible offseason for them. Obviously, the Lakers did incredibly well. Not only did they get Anthony Davis, but they were able to build their depth around LeBron and Davis, and they ended up getting Bookie Cousins, Danny Green, so I believe that they did very well. Obviously, the Brooklyn Nets getting Kyrie and KD. No need to get into that. The Utah Jazz... Mike Conley paired up alongside Donovan Mitchell is a small backcourt but insane defensive backcourt. They also got Bogdanovich, Ed Davis, Jeff Green and Moutier. Amazing, amazing offseason by the Utah Jazz. Their depth is looking incredible. And then the last team is obviously the Clippers. No need to get into this. Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, you know the rest. With that being said, let me know what you guys think. Who are the winners and the losers of this year's offseason? Be sure to leave a like if you enjoy the video. Subscribe if you're new for daily NBA content. Be sure to hit the notification button and follow me on Instagram and I'm out.